Well, firstly, thank you very much um, to Mike and Kate for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Now, we used to think that synapses had very few proteins on the postsynaptic side of excitatory synapses, but in fact they have a very large number, there's more than 100 times as many, there's about 1,000 highly conserved proteins you'll find in the postsynaptic proteome. This set of proteins turns out to have been enormously important in disease, and a number of years ago we found that over 130 different brain diseases are caused by mutations in the postsynaptic proteome, and including many <coughs> proteins that are enriched in various common disorders. But the proteome gave us an insight into the evolutionary origins of the synapse. And in fact, the ancient machinery that gave rise to the synapse first evolved about four billion years ago in prokaryotic organisms, these signaling complexes, which became more complicated. And all of this machinery was co-opted into the first metazoan synapses and underwent a dramatic expansion about 500 million years ago by virtue of two whole genome duplications. Now, these complexes are really the building blocks of the synapse, and if you can, as you can see here, these are native electrophoresis, and you're looking at bands that correspond to complexes and supercomplexes of many different synaptic proteins. Now, here is a, the organization, a summary of the organization of the proteins. There's a hierarchical organization which goes from the gene expression to the individual proteins which are assembled into complexes, and many of those are then in, assembled into supercomplexes, and these supramolecular structures are then allocated into different synapses to generate synapse diversity, and the overall diversity is descri described in the synaptome. Now, um, if you look in different regions of the human or the mouse brain, there is different compositions of the postsynaptic proteome and the relative abundance of all of those different uh, proteins. But what we wanted to do was to look at this at the single synapse resolution level and describe the synaptome, which is a set of all brain synapses. And we last year published the first single synapse resolution molecular maps across the brain described in this paper here. The way we did this was to label these large complexes here and these smaller complexes here by virtue of inserting into a key component of those complexes EGFP or, SAP, or this Cusabira orange protein so that the complexes became fluorescent. And if you looked at a piece of a brain from mice expressing both of those, you could see these puncta, which are synapses that contain either one or the other or both of those different sorts of proteins. If you look at these uh, sections here from the mouse brain, um, you can see the differential distribution of these different markers and the beautiful patterning. But what we acquired was the individual synaptic puncture detection of around about one billion individual synapses, and in each one of those measured the localization of the protein or their co-localization, as well as size and shape parameters, and we mapped all of this onto the Allen Reference Atlas. When you do that, and in these delineated regions as shown in the atlas and across the whole brain here, you can see that for these two different proteins, they have a differential distribution, and there's also a differential uh, size and intensity parameters across all parts of the brain. It's evident that every region of the brain has a particular signature of synapse parameters. Using this brain-wide data, we wanted to develop the first brain-wide synapse catalog, and we did that by taking the simple classification of synapses that contain only PSD95 or SAP102 or both, but we could further divide those three types into 37 subtypes by the addition of various size and shape parameters. Now I'll show you where these subtypes are differentially distributed, and here's a very nice example where we're looking just in the hippocampus of the mouse, and this particular subtype here is obviously highly enriched in the CA1, this one in the CA2, CA3, and dentate. And if you look across all other areas of the brain in our online atlas that we have here, you'll see beautiful differential distributions of all of these different subtypes, revealing all kinds of boundaries, layers, and regions um, describing this remarkable synaptic architecture um, in the brain. Now, this is a map where we're illustrating the abundance or the most abundant of any one of the 37 subtypes in parts of the mouse brain. And you can see there is these beautiful regional distributions with differential compositions of these different subtypes. This is a particularly interesting map. It's a synapse diversity map. 
So using this heat map scale here, where you, what you're looking at is those regions of the brain which contain the highest synapse diversity, shown in red, for example, in the hippocampus and in the uh, neocortex. But in those more basal structures, there's a much lower level of diversity. And it's intriguing that we find the highest synapse complexity in those parts of the brain that are associated with higher information processing capacity. This distribution, in fact, of synapse types has a global architecture, and here across 800 subregions of the mouse brain for the 37 subtypes, you can see that each subtype has its own distribution, unique distribution, and every brain region is composed of different composition of those subtypes. We can ask how are similar, how similar or different are different parts of the brain using a similarity matrix here, where all of the regions are compared against each other. And what you can see are three large boxes here. And these groupings are very interesting because it is those parts of the mouse brain which are derived from the earliest divisions of the neural tube, indicating that very early patterning events of the embryo are leaving a shadow or an imprint on the synaptome organization of the adult mouse brain. Now, you might be wondering if the synaptic composition and molecular architecture is in any way related to the connectome, and indeed it is, and I'll show you an example here where we've used the data from the Allen Institute structural connectome where they're, co they're looking at the connectivity between different brain regions, and we looked at the synaptome signatures of those different regions, and what, we have, what you can see here is these correlation coefficients. There is a very high degree of correlation between, of composition of the synapse composition in different areas of the brain and their connectivity. And that's important because that tells us that this hierarchical molecular architecture which builds this synaptic diversity in the synaptome map is directly relevant to the structural connectome um, of, the, of the nervous system. I don't have time to go into this, but you can look at these couple of papers here. But we have related this synaptome architecture in different parts of the brain to the functional connectome by using task-specific fMRI, resting state fMRI, and PET data. But I'd like to point out something which I think is truly remarkable and has been entirely underappreciated, which is that there is an immense synapse diversity in the nervous system. From two proteins, we can see three synapse types and 37 subtypes. With 10 proteins, you'll get 1,000 types, and 10 to the 11 subtypes, which happens to be the number of synapses in the mouse. But there's far more than that, because synapses have over 1,000 proteins to 200 complexes and other forms of variation. So it would seem to me that an animal's brain can only house a tiny fraction of the total number of possible synapse types. <coughs> Let's talk briefly about the functional importance of all of this. And I just want to remind you of one of the most important and fundamental aspects of the nervous system, namely information is in patterns of activity. And when asking what a pattern of activity does to synapses with differential protein composition, they generate different sized postsynaptic responses. You get a differential uh, pattern of activity. Now, asking what that does within a synaptome map where you have many different types of synapses, I'll schematize it here where we're looking not at the molecular types of the synapses, but their postsynaptic response amplitude for a particular pattern of activity that may be associated with this behavior. These synapses and those synapses will have differential outputs. And with other patterns of activity, you will get changing outputs from the synaptome map, which in effect creates a mental movie, a dynamic, continuously changing output from that map. What I've just shown you is that information in the nervous system is written in the proteome of synapses and their diverse, and diverse types of synapses, and it can be readily read or recalled out by simply uh, putting patterns of activity onto them. So complex proteomes and diverse synapses generate enormous information storage capacity within the nervous system, and importantly, behavioral and perceptual sequences, temporal sequences, can be stored and recalled from synaptomes. We um, have... Uh, put all of this together into a model which is the synaptomic theory where each behavior is represented in maps of synapse diversity. And of course, by contrast, the traditional model is one of the connectionist theory where each behavior is represented in a circuit or ensemble of connected neurons. Now, I want to talk about the organizational principles that I've already described for you, but now I'm going to place them across the context of the lifespan. And in this study here, we were interested in sampling across the lifespan gene expression at many different time points so that we could then focus on a trajectory of any given gene and look at these turning points 
They're interesting because that indicates there's a regulatory event going on. And um, in this study here, um, we examined a very large number of uh, mice and across a large uh, lifespan of time. And we looked at all of these different genes. We identified the trajectories, the turning points, and using machine learning, identified the various patterns. And what is really striking about this is that if you now take a mouse, um, a sample from an individual mouse, and ask, and we know it's obviously it's actual age, we can see how well um, we can predict the age of the mice. And this is a rather striking graph because you can see that we can predict very accurately, just from a single sample, um, the age of the mouse. Now, does that occur in humans, which obviously have a lifespan that's many-fold longer than that? And we use uh, uh, publicly available data to uh, do the same kind of analysis. And in fact, we see the same kind of result here. So at every age, in mouse and human, there is a characteristic pattern of gene expression. What that means is that throughout life, it's like turning the chapters of a book, you're constantly changing your gene expression pattern throughout the, all ages. Now, when do most of the genes undergo these regulatory turning points? We'd actually thought it would be at quite a young age, but we were quite surprised to find here in humans that the peak age is 26, and it's a slight delay um, in females, which is highly statistically uh, significant. When you ask yourself who are, and what are those genes encoding, what are the molecules that are important in the young adult brain, well, it turns out they're highly enriched, surprisingly enough, in postsynaptic proteome and other important complexes that are there. In other words, there's a major synaptic reorganization going on in the young adult human brain. Now, we've become very interested in understanding how this synaptome maps change across the lifespan, and a PhD student, Melissa Cizeron, and a postdoc, Ricky Quee, have been mapping from birth to 18 months at many different time points across the lifespan. Um, this synaptome using our uh, methods where we use our genetic reporters and looking at many different brain regions. And I'm going to show you just a couple of brief points here. Here is the lifespan. Here is the synaptic puncture density, and you can see there's a, there's a rapid increase. There's some interesting variation here and decremental changes. But there's also some quite dramatic changes at older ages um, in size and other shape parameters. But what is really striking is when you now look at these sorts of data sets by classification of the 37 subtypes, and these are just in different brain areas. And I want you to see at these different ages, there's differential compositional signatures at every age of the synapse diversity in different brain areas. Now, we have also been able to ask how does the organization of the synaptome change in the lifespan. And these are these similarity matrices. And these are very interesting. Let's look at here in the first week postnatal life. And we're looking at the correlation along these two um, axes. Um, uh, down here. And you can see that there's a lot of um, similarity within this here. And as age progresses, you see it tightens up into these boxes here. So it peaks in around three to six months of age. But notice as we get older, we are now losing that differentiation and we're seeing a kind of disorganization, potentially relevant to cognitive aging within the synaptome map. I'm going to finish by mentioning something about disease. And um, as I've already mentioned for you, synaptopathy or mutations that disrupt synapses are extremely common and extremely important in many, many different diseases. But I'd like to put it in the context of what that means for the synaptome map. The first thing it means is remember that different synapse proteins, as I've shown you here, they all, each one of them has what we believe to be a unique synaptome map across the brain. And that means that each mutation will selectively interfere with specific synapses in certain parts of the synaptome map. It also means that other synapses will be left alone, and they may be the resilient synapses. So synaptome mapping can help it find vulnerable and resilient synapses. But another aspect which is really very interesting is that we have, these are synaptome maps in mice of uh, mice carrying a mutation in a gene PSD93 and, and a gene called SAP102. And we're looking at the synaptic changes in another synaptic protein. And you can see widespread changes across the nervous system in those mice. This is really interesting because from a technical point of view, we can now see at any point in the brain where the mutation is exerting its effect without having any a priori bias or hypotheses. We can do it systematically in this way. But what I believe this is showing is that because these proteins here, th th this mutation here is in a different complex to the complex that we're measuring, and th uh, in the same complex, and it's in a different complex, we think that 
every synaptic disease will change the synaptome map. And of course, other mutations in transcription factors and other sorts of things will also change the synaptome map. So we propose that synaptome map changes or synaptome reprogramming is going to be a general feature of neuropathology. Where do we go next? Well, I'd like to tell you a few things we're thinking about in the last minute, which is that we, um, uh, we've put together a plan using our technology to map the human brain synaptome initially in normal human adults. And we intend to make the first synaptome map of the human brain and catalogue the synapse types of the human brain, generating reference resources linked to all these other publicly available resources. We've been building some very interesting viewing tools, which you can read about in our existing paper. And these will, of course, be a very important foundation for disease studies. Another translational aspect of synaptomes, which I've already just very briefly touched on, is that we've demonstrated that brain imaging modalities are very important and relevant to the synaptome. And I think there's ways to bring synaptome science into the world of brain imaging in the clinic. And quite obviously, the technology that I've described for you can be used to study the neuropathology of individuals who either have genetic disorder, brain injury, or other conditions, and identify the change synapses. And there's also ways, uh, there's also interesting studies that can be done looking at how drugs and other interventions may change things. And finally, I put in this slide, this is my last slide, because there is an interest in models here. And what I'm drawing for you here is that the different species will have different synaptome <coughs> maps and comparative synaptomics will be important. And it may be that different species have different species-specific synapses. And that's obviously going to be important for whether or not that model is relevant to humans. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people who've done this. Principally, the synaptome mapping was done by two PhD students, Faye Zhu and Melissa Cizeron, with Ricky Kui, who did this extraordinary amount of wonderful image analysis, most of which I've shown for you today. And I've mentioned some of the biochemistry of Rene Frank. And my colleague, Naburu Komiyama, has been a, really a key figure in generating many of these mice. Thank you very much. So one, one of the issues in uh, people who are doing uh, cell type analysis in brain or in any organ for that matter is the distinction between cell type and cell state. And I wonder if something similar might be happening in these synapses in the sense that um, they may not actually define di different synapses per se, but different states of the same or similar synapses. So how dynamic are these protein expression patterns? Yeah, yeah. So um, let me just address that more generally. The, we developed a technology whereby we can do cell type specific synaptome mapping and obviously that's a very key thing to map onto the major progress that's going on with single cell transcriptome work and I think that's going to be very important um, uh, to do that. Um, as far as the uh, stability, you can take, for example, uh, you know, half a dozen mice at a, uh, uh, a given age and you get very, very similar synaptome maps. But I can also tell you that you can influence activity, for example, with dark rearing and change the synaptome maps. And what you see is certain subtypes are undergoing certain changes as opposed to others. So there's going to be clearly dynamic subtypes. And I'd also like to flag another area of dynamics as well. It turns out that synaptic proteins are not very long-lived. They all live about a week or two. So this map is constantly being rebuilt. Any other questions? I have a question, um, which is that mm. I was interested in the, um, the gene uh, switch in the mid-20s. Yes. And mm. I wondered what you thought that might relate. What are the, what are the functional outcomes of that? What yeah. In the um, manuscript which we published in eLife in 2017, which describes all of that work, um, in addition to describing the um, synaptic changes there, we describe using um, an analysis method which allows us to look at the changes in many other cell types at different ages. But particularly with respect to the young adults, a major part of that manuscript is where we ask to what extent are other disease-relevant gene sets being regulated. And one of the really striking and I think really exciting findings from that paper was that the genes that have been found to be relevant to schizophrenia are being regulated as a group in exactly the age of onset of schizophrenia, first episode psychosis, which corresponds pretty much with those peaks. And moreover, it also corresponds to the well-described delay in schizophrenia in females that is observed. So we think that this raises a very interesting possibility that the reason first episode psychosis comes on with schizophrenics in young adults, it's not necessarily because of something that happened in the environment. It's just that by virtue of this genetic lifespan calendar, it exposes the um, vulnerability of the individuals at that time. So it's a genetic timing event that is occurring. 
Thank you. Thank you.